Hi, I'm Suzanne Hubbard, and this is Talk Time. Today, I'm talking with LaVonda Robertson, and we're going to speak about some issues that some of you may find uncomfortable, but it needs to be said. LaVonda. Hey. Hello. Tell me about yourself. Well, of course, my name is LaVonda Robertson. I'm 41. I'm from Walker County, Alabama. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a mother of three kids. Mm -hmm. had a son that passed away. I have two grandkids. Mm -hmm. Precious. Um, on the October 25th, I will have three years clean off heroin and all other substances. But heroin was was my go-to thing. That mm -hmm. was my, at the time, that was my favorite thing to do. Right. So, <clears throat> what started you down this road of addiction? Um, I've always I've always struggled with self-image, mm -hmm. and there was just always something about myself that I just I just didn't like. Like everybody would be like, "Oh, you're so beautiful," but when I looked in the mirror, I, I didn't see what other people saw. Right. Um, and I remember um, I used to participate in beauty pageants a lot. If I felt like if I didn't win, it was because I was ugly, and no one ever told me. Someone else may not think you're as, as beautiful as someone else. Right. <clears throat> so um, my, that's where my self-image started, and, and I would make myself throw up. Um, I wouldn't eat. And then, for me, I think that kind of like got the ball rolling for my, mm -hmm. my mental illness, per se. Um, you know, I just, I always want, I never want, I, I just didn't like to act right for some reason. Right. I just, I just uh, to me, that just wasn't, that wasn't my personality. Mm -hmm. um, but I always, I was always, I wanted to have fun. Right. So, um, my, my views on having fun was skipping school, um, smoking pot, drinking, you know, whatever you weren't supposed to do. That's what you wanted That's, yeah, to do. I was doing right the opposite. Um, right. So I remember I had a procedure done <clears throat> on my foot and the doctor had wrote me, I think, lower tabs. Mm -hmm. Well, when I took those, I felt like I had arrived. Mm -hmm. I mean, I loved everybody, <clears throat> you know, just everything was great. Mm -hmm. um, nobody <clears throat> ever, like growing up, nobody ever talked about heroin addiction because at the at that time, I think the worst thing you could have done was, I guess, smoke pot or mm -hmm. whatever, or drink. Right. <clears throat> um, so, you know, of course, I'd done that. You know, I so I would I managed to fit in with any kind of crowd. Mm -hmm. You know, if the good kids, you know, I could do that. You know, the bad ones, I could really do that mm -hmm. and so I just started dabbling into like different things mm -hmm. opioids was was the thing because I could always say the doctor gave that to me so mm -hmm. it's okay right so nobody can look down on me and you know I I never never really knew what addiction was right didn't really know what eating disorders was because nobody ever talked about it right um nobody that's just not something that was talked about. Um, but I remember um, getting in trouble when I was 18. That was my first little thing with the police. And you know, I didn't thought my life was over. I got a drug paraphernalia charge. I didn't thought they was gonna send me to prison, mm -hmm. but they didn't. But when I got to jail and I seen people that I knew, it was, you know, it wasn't as bad as everybody makes it out to be. Like TV, it's not that bad. Um, so then, you know, like I said, I had this eating disorder and then I had opioid problems. And in order for my family not to be on my butt about not eating, I tried math. Well, you know, I could eat, but I could do math. 
and they would never know because my family don't know anything about math. Right. You know, once again, it's not talked about. So um, I got started on that. Um, I didn't discriminate on which drug, mm -hmm. you know. I preferred opioids or mm -hmm. heroin or Dilaudid, whatever. That's what I preferred. But if you had something else, I wouldn't want to turn my nose to it. So um, that's, you know, that rocked on. I had my son when um, I was 16. I had like, <laughs> I had this vision of being the perfect mother. Right. You know, like at the time people were talking about if you stand in front of microwaves or whatever, mm -hmm. it could cause damage to your child. So I wouldn't stand in front of a microwave. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, um, but, you know, I was in high school and my mom and stepdad, you know, having abortion went an option mm -hmm. and um, adoption went an option. Oh. So, you know, my mom and stepdad were like, if you will stay in school, and if you will act right, you know, of course you can live here, we'll financially support you, you know, all that. Everything sounded perfect. Um, and then, you know, I would go to school, my mom would watch my son, and then on the weekends my stepdad and then be like, you know what, you're a kid, go enjoy, go enjoy yourself. Now, I'm pretty sure when they meant enjoy yourself was go to the movies, go out to eat with your friends, it didn't mean go get high and act like you didn't have no good common sense. So, um, you know, the weekends turned in to during the week. Mm -hmm. um, and then it just kind of escalated and it got out of hand before I even knew it got out of hand. Right. Um, it didn't bother me that my mom worked 11 to 7 and my stepdad was going to work every morning mm -hmm. early and that they're having to watch a small child. It, you know, it, it, I didn't, I, I didn't care. I was just worried about what I wanted to do. Um, I have an older brother. Um, he was a hellion when he was younger, but you know, he decided you know what, I'm not going to act a fool anymore. I'm going to get married. I'm going to have kids. I'm going to have a good life. And he just stopped. Mm -hmm. He was just, he just was normal. And, um, but that, that didn't, that didn't work out for me. Mm -hmm. I guess for one, I didn't want it to, to start with. Um, my brother is very black and white. Mm -hmm. You either do right or you do wrong. There's no in-betweens. There's no pity parties for you, you know. Um, that's just not how it was. So my brother got on my very last nerve, mm -hmm. you know. And he was a protective brother too, so that didn't help me out any. Um, he, you know, he has three kids. Um, I would like to say that I'm a part of my nieces and nephews' life, but I'm not because my brother, my brother didn't put up with stuff like that. You, he, mm -hmm. His kids would not be subject to that. Um, I have a sister. She's 20, oh my goodness, she's 21 or 20 years younger than me. I feel so bad now. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, she, she went to school. She done right. She didn't act crazy, you know. Mm -hmm. She had goals in life, and she's achieved those. Right. But I was so jealous of that. Mm -hmm. because I didn't, that's what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. but I didn't want to work hard for it. I wanted you to give that to me. Um, and so, and then my dad and stepmom, they, you know, they weren't, they weren't going to, my sister wasn't going to be, I guess, subjected, if I guess is what I'm trying, you know, to stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, I remember uh, being over there, I think it was her birthday party or something, and I passed out on the couch. And mm -hmm. when I'm saying like not passed out because I was tired, passed out because I was high mm -hmm. and it scared her. Mm -hmm. So there's always been like, you know, my sister wanting to have a relationship with me, but then my jealousy just, you know, it was like, it was crazy. So um, I guess you would say I robbed my sister of having 
a relationship with me. Mm -hmm. um, our relationship is not perfect, but we're working on it. Mm -hmm. um, I have a lot of respect for my sister, you know, because she worked hard. Mm -hmm. and, and on top of that, you know, during my drug addiction, you know, she stepped in and had to take care of my youngest daughter. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's 19, 20 years old. She, she didn't have to do that, right. you know. But at the time, you know, I was very ungrateful. You know, mm -hmm. how dare you be the mother role? I'm her mother. And, you know, and so that caused issues. Um, you know, I will say this. Um, when my parents divorced when I was young, I cannot stress enough on how grateful and how fortunate I am to have a stepdad and a stepmother like that I have. I mean, they just, you know, my stepdad, you know, bless his heart, you know, he's had, he's had to see this the whole time. Mm -hmm. You know, um, my dad, I don't want to say he didn't have to see it, but I didn't want to go around him because I didn't want to hear him bitch and complain. Oh, I'm sorry, but I don't no. hate you guys. But, you know, he would always call me out on it and I wasn't trying to hear that. Mm -hmm. So I guess he had to suffer from a distance, but my mom and stepdad had to see it every single day. So you were a drug addict. Mm -hmm. And you were three years clean now? And I'll tell you where I was three years clean. Congratulations. <laughs> Because I know that that was a hard road. What have you lost in your life by your drug addiction? Well, you know, I, I can't say, like materialist, I haven't lost anything. Right. Because I've never worked in it. Everything's been gave to me, so my family's lost stuff because, you know, mm -hmm. of my drug addiction. But... You know, um, I I lost um, I lost you know I lost my childhood really, mm -hmm. not because I got pregnant, because I was battling demons at a young age already, mm -hmm. and then you know when people should be enjoying high school and stuff, I'm having to worry about where to get the next pain pill at, mm -hmm. you know, um, and I've lost you know. I lost the little bit of happiness I had. I lost it. I, I, I lost the person I wanted to be. This person that I hadn't envisioned on being, mm -hmm. I lost. So it, it robbed you of your hopes <clears throat> and your dreams. Exactly. Right. And now, I know that a lot of people who don't understand the cycle of addiction, they say, well, you know, it's a personal choice. But tell me how what goes through your mind and how much invasiveness and control that this this substance has over you okay so yeah I agree it is a personal choice mm -hmm. you know I chose to make those decisions however I was not educated mm -hmm. um, this is what's gonna happen if you do this mm -hmm. I didn't have consequences, mm -hmm. you know. I would go to jail, they slap, you know, let's just pay your fine and you're good to go. So I did not, I never knew what responsibility was, consequences, mm -hmm. or any of that. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't educated. Wow. Now they had, don't drink and drive, but I mean, drinking and driving wasn't my problem. Mm -hmm. It was other things that nobody wants to talk about because it's scary. Right. You know, um, my family never thought that um, their daughter would be a heroin addict. Right. I never thought that I would be a heroin addict. Right, because that's not what that's you not saw. What, that's not what I envisioned. Right. right. Um, you know, and then, you know, I had my oldest daughter, and I got married. And once again, I had this vision. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because my mom and stepdad ended up raising my son. I lived there, but I was on drugs. Right. So I, I was just in this body form. So when I got married, okay, I'm not doing drugs anymore. I'm going to be a great mother. 
this is, and I'm living happily ever after. Mm -hmm. It's not how it is. You know, my husband at the time was a drug addict. Um, once again, I didn't, um, at this time I, I was educated some because I'd done been in rehab. However, I just, I didn't, I wanted somebody to fix me. I didn't want to fix myself. I, first of all, I didn't even want to look at the issues that I had myself. Right. You know, I had body image. You know, I had shame and guilt to, you know, um, of not being a mother to my son. Mm -hmm. My mom and stepdad's raising him. You know, my marriage failed. My ex-in-laws ended up with my oldest daughter mm -hmm. when she was three. You know, I had all intentions on getting her back. Right. She's 17. She still don't live with me. Mm -hmm. But I'm grateful for her grandparents for for raising her. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm just grateful for my whole family because they've all stepped in and done what obviously I wasn't doing. Um. You know, and just when I lost custody of her, you know, I was already shooting dope, but it wasn't socially, it was socially accepted, so I didn't do it all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but boy, when, uh, when it hit the fan that everybody was really doing it, I, I wasn't trying to keep it a secret anymore. Right. I just wasn't. For some reason, I wanted to punish my my family for my bad choices. Mm -hmm. You know, why couldn't you just fix me? You know, I'm your daughter. Why, why am I like this? Somebody please tell me. Mm -hmm. Well, you're like this because, you know, you continue to make wrong decisions. Right. You know, and first, you're not even trying to change. Mm -hmm. You're ch I've changed because the court told me to, but after that, you know, mm -hmm. they cut me loose. I was back at it again. Mm -hmm. um, I got on meth. Um, and of course, I was on opioids voyage too. Um, and it just went like a downward spiral. Like looking back at it now, looking back at it now, I can see where it went from here to straight to shit and like. No time. Right. <clears throat> but at the time, I, I would always think, well, if I'm not doing this, then I'm fine. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not homeless, so I'm doing fine. Yes, she was homeless because you wouldn't pay no bills at your mama's house. Right. You know, but that's how I looked at it. Mm -hmm. I have a nice car because my stepdad and my mom paid for it, not because I had a job or anything. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, I've had several friends and cousins to die from drugs. Mm -hmm. And not one time did I ever stop to think, hey, you need to do something about that. Mm -hmm. Or you're not going to make it. And I'd be like, well, they don't know what they're doing. Because you know, I'm a professional. Right. I mean, that's why they, <laughs> they didn't know what they was doing. I know my limits. But it got to a point where... You didn't even I hear didn't, about that. Yeah, limits were limits. Um, mm -hmm. I had my third. I, yeah, I had my third child, which is my youngest daughter. <sighs> Bless her heart. She's been through it all. I mean, my other two kids. My, my oldest daughter. She lived with other grandparents. Mm -hmm. So she didn't see. She just knows what people told her. Right. You know, my son didn't see it because, I mean, he did, but he didn't. Mm -hmm. And my youngest daughter, she's seen it all. Mm -hmm. And I robbed that child of her child. I robbed them all of their childhood. Mm -hmm. With you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, who wants to say, why aren't your mom at any of your events? Oh, because she's on shooting heroin. Or she's doing this, you know, mm -hmm. and and it's sad. I, I'm sad for them, 
But on the other hand, my kids are educated. Right. I hate that they're educated the way they are. Right. It's just reality. Right. That's just how it is. Um, once again, you know, I had this, I was going to, my third daughter, well, I had no intentions on getting married because me and her dad just, we had issues of our own. But I was going to be the best mother ever. Mm -hmm. Wasn't going to do drugs no more. So, um, went to rehab. Everything's going to be perfect, right? I'm just going to, all these problems that I've got going on, they're going to go away. No. Mm -hmm. They don't go away. Yeah. Sometimes, I mean, not sometimes, I feel like once you get clean, that those internal problems you got inside sometimes are far worse than drugs because this is stuff that even when you get clean you have to deal with that you don't want to deal with. Right. I didn't want to deal that I was a crappy mother, a terrible daughter, a terrible sister, a terrible aunt. I didn't want to deal with all that. Right. So, Which is why you took drugs to begin with so you could forget how crap you right. were. Or right. Or feel better about myself. Right. And right. um, so it's just, it's been it's been a crazy crazy time. Um, you know, I remember the first time I done a shot of dope. Somebody said, "Welcome to the family." I thought, "Oh hell no, nah. these people are crazy." Mm -hmm. I'm not their family, that you know, but I didn't realize that they're talking about a whole different kind of family. Right. Because, you know, when you have family, there's certain families, you just can't get rid of your family. Mm -hmm. Well, when you're on the needle and you're, whatever you're shooting, mm -hmm. it's like family, you just, it's hard to break away. Right. Um, especially when it has a hold on you. Mm -hmm. And it had a hold on me, like I didn't, like nothing ever. How many times did it take for you using the needle, for you to get addicted? It took me twice. Mm -hmm. Right. And I know a lot of people who go down that road say that, you know, well, it's just this one time, or, you know, I, I won't have a problem. It won't happen to me. And I'm sure that you felt the same way at the time. Yeah. But what's the reality of that? The reality is, you can only say it's going to take, and you know what, it may take you somebody five times, mm -hmm. but you keep on, and you're going to be addicted, and you're not going to realize it, because I didn't realize it. Right. You know, I didn't realize I had an opiate problem until I couldn't get any. Right. You know, I, I didn't, you don't realize you have a problem until you run out of whatever, and you're sick. Right. You know, I overdosed 13 times. It's a lot. Yes. You're lucky to be here. And a lot of those were before my son passed away, I was already doing heroin. Mm hmm. But my son being the age that he was and him just being so overprotective and at the time I thought he was always being nosy, mm -hmm. you know, I had to, I couldn't get to where I really wanted to be mm -hmm. because I was always afraid of him seeing me or better yet, him telling on me. Mm -hmm. And um, because, you know, after, you know, the second rehab, you know, they were like, my mom stepped up, look. This is not acceptable, you know, you can, you better get your shit together, you know. But, you know, I knew if they ever found out that, you know, because it's like I could make excuses for opiates. Mm -hmm. The doctor gave them to me, it's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. Now, what am I going to say about heroin? The doctor ain't write me a prescription of heroin. No. So, I knew when they found out about that, that would be the end it would be the end of the road for this one. Right. Um, so, uh, I remember I, after he passed away, I think it might have been three, two or three weeks, I don't know, everything runs together, um, I overdosed. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And I remember every time I would get a shot of dope, I would think, please let this be the last shot. I can't live like this anymore. Mm -hmm. I was saying, I was praying I couldn't live like this. I didn't have to live like that because I could go get help if it was offered. But I just didn't want to. Um, My grandmother always made sure I went to church. Um, But it's like when my son's accident happened, you know, I remember praying for him. Praying, you know. God, you know, I'm a a heroin addict, a junkie, I'm worthless. Please just take me. Mm -hmm. Please, he's just a kid. Right. And that's not how it worked out. Right. You've lost your child. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Let me ask you this. What was the final straw? What gave you the strength that you needed and the incentive you needed to clean up your act? I remember going in my son's room and um, talking to him for the final time. But they took him off life support. And me and my son always thought about me being on heroin. Always. And I'll say this, before he moved to Florida, you know, it's poor pitiful Lavonda, why are you leaving me? Because you know I'm this great mother, you know, mm-hmm. so why, I mean, <laughs> It was just, I, my thinking was so crazy. And I asked him, I said, why are you moving to Florida for? And I remember him looking at me, he said, because when you die, maybe it won't be so hard on me. And I remember being mad, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. How are you just gonna leave your mother? I mean, because like, you know, I've been this great mother, I mean, for, to him his whole life, you know, I mean, why wouldn't he want to leave? Why, would, why wouldn't he want a better life? Right. And I was so selfish that I just, I guess I just wanted him to be here with me, to be, I guess, to watch me slowly kill myself. Um, so after that, I remember my stepdad telling me, you want to sink or swim, you're not going to do it in my house. Mm-hmm. Don't call me until you're in a detox that you pay for. You're going to sign your custody rights over to Anna, that's my youngest daughter, mm-hmm. because that kid deserves stability. Mm-hmm. And she does, she does not deserve to see what she is seeing. Mm-hmm. And don't ever call me. I don't care if you sleep under a bridge, I don't care if you eat, if you're hungry, call them junkie friends that you're getting high with. Mm-hmm. Don't call me. And I've, and you know, my stepdad's always been like, you can't do this, get out of my house. And I'd always call, please just let me come back. Mm-hmm. Okay. But I remember that day when he looked at me and he said that. I knew he was serious. Mm-hmm. And I remember going down there. You know, my stepmom had these papers dropped up for me to um, to sign over. It was just temporary custody, mm-hmm. and I didn't want to. Right. I wanted to take care of her, of course. Of course. But it was like she, her and her sister Lisa were all I had. Mm-hmm. But I wasn't being a mother. I loved them with everything in me. My actions were showing different. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can tell you all day, I love you, but if I'm not showing up to your event, or can't tuck you into bed at night, or make time to talk to you when you're having a problem, you know, yeah. it's not a mother. No. Um. So I done that, and um. So then, basically, I was officially. Relieved of, I guess, being a mother, I guess that's what you call it. So I started shooting dope anytime I cared. I didn't care if I overdosed. Mm-hmm. It was getting to the point where I'd overdosed twice in one day, and that was okay with me. Mm-hmm. Um, if I didn't wake up, that'd been even better. 
Um, I thought I was being punished. I thought God punished me by taking my son mm -hmm. for being a drug addict. And I know now that's not the case. But, you know, he took my hope, you know, not having anything because my ass sure wasn't going to get a job. Right. I mean, who wants to get a job? I got to get high, you know, and that's how I saw it. And, um, and I remember a friend of mine, her name's Joanne, my angel. <laughs> She came and got me at a trap house, and she said, you can come home with me. And I, a Christian lady, once again, here's these people praying for me, and I'm the idea when nobody pray for me. Mm -hmm. Please, don't, I don't talk about God, don't pray for me, anything. Just keep that to yourself. And uh, she said, and you're going to, we had this plan, or she had this plan. Mm -hmm. And uh, I stayed with her, and... You know, and one rule was you can't get high and you can't shoot up in my house. Well, you know, me being the disrespectful person that I am, I, I'd done that. And mm -hmm. she found out and she said, I love you, but we're going to get you some help. So, okay, so, you know, so I'm broke. Uh, my family ain't going to give me nothing. Mm -hmm. Downey wouldn't accept a phone call from me. So, me being the, the person that I am, I'm going to call Bradford. Mm -hmm. Because I knew in my head, I thought, well, first of all, you have money to go to Bradford, you got to have insurance, and I ain't got neither. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to show, I want to show effort that right. I'm trying to get help. Right. So, Bradford kept calling and calling and calling. And I remember the lady telling me, I was like, well, I got to do this. She said, baby, Bradford's open 24 hours a day. And I was thinking, of course you are. Mm -hmm. But I went down there, and the lady was talking to me. I said, look, I have no money. My family's not going to help. I said, if they had a penny, they ain't going to give it to me. Mm -hmm. And um, she's like, well, what's the past year your life been like? I said, <laughs> what's the... I said, um... My son's passed away. Can't see my kids. My heroin junkie. I want to die. Mm -hmm. I'm homeless. Why else more? I mean, mm -hmm. well, I mean, I'm just a worthless person. Had all these things. They had not one positive thing I could say about myself. So she said, "Well, give me a minute. And we'll, we'll get you somewhere." So I'm thinking, okay, great. So. <laughs> So she comes back and she said, oh, we found you a place. And I was like, of course you did. Mm -hmm. So I was like, look, she said, well, Bradford's gonna let you do talks here. I said, look, I do not have any money. Like, I don't know how many times I got to tell you this. I do not have any money. My family's not going, I have nothing. And she said, Bradford's gonna let you do talks for free. And I was thinking, of course you are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I I had said before that that um, that if I ever got a chance to detox, I wouldn't go back to that life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, when I would say my goodbyes to my son, I told him, I said, I'm not going to be like this forever. Mm -hmm. I'm just not. You know, it's a little late now. I mean... Why didn't I do this when he was alive? Why, why does it take a tragedy for me to even want to change? So, Chayton, the lady said, we'll call you when there's a bed available. Go home and pack your stuff. And I was like, great. So, I didn't even get out of the parking lot. And this lady called. She said, well, go get your stuff and hurry back. And I was like, she sure ain't leaving me no time to go get high. One last time. Because, you know, it's always that mm -hmm. one last time. Oh, yeah. One last time, because I'm never going to do it again. Well, it was so weird because it seemed like everybody that I knew that sold heroin was out that day. Mm -hmm. Of course I was. Mm -hmm. So, I checked into Bradford. Um, I 
cut all ties with the people that um, that I got hot with. And I, you know, and some of them people that I love, I love dearly. Mm -hmm. But two addicts can't save each other. No. It's just impossible. I've tried. Um, so when I checked into Bradford on October 25th, <clears throat> I knew that my son's uh, anniversary would be. Mm -hmm. Coming up. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to get hot. Mm -hmm. But if I'm out on the street and I'm and I'm sober and all this all these memories of did he know I loved him, you know. The pain the, and the pain guilt. and the guilt. Mm -hmm. My kids hate me. Poor pitiful Lavonda. Um I would probably got high. Mm -hmm. So I went to this one place in Huntsville, it did not work out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Of course, my dad took me up there. And when I tell you, he helped me get my bags out of the car. And I didn't even get a chance to wait by because he done sped away. I mean, I was oh. like, good Lord. Mm -hmm. um, but it didn't work out up there. Mm -hmm. But I knew I did not want to get high. Mm -hmm. There was a part of me. I was like, just go get high. You end up getting high anyway. So I called my best friend that was in recovery. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you gotta come get me before I get high. She's like, okay, I'm gonna get my sponsor. I was like, of course you are. Cause see, with her, she brought her sponsor. There was no way I could manipulate her. Right. And she already knew that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they was calling around places and this other girl that I knew back in high school that, um. She was in recovery. She's calling places. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even get along with her in high school. But she wanted to help me. Right. Why would you want to help somebody that you didn't even like in high school? Because that's what people do. Right. Just been there. So they're, they called and told me they found, you know, at first I was like, 30 days is the limit. Not, you know, more. Then it's 60 days. Nine, I mean, 90 days, that's it. Don't ask me. No, mm -hmm. I'm not doing it. Then it was six months. Nine months. Don, I don't talk about it. If, it. if it's over nine months, I don't talk about it. And it was on a Sunday, and they said, there's this place in Coleman called RWO. I said, y'all not about to send me to no military shit. No. And they said, no, it was called Restore Women Outreach. And I talked to a lady, and it was a Sunday. Mm -hmm. People don't do intakes on Sunday. So I thought I had that little bitty window of going home with my best friend and manipulating her on letting me stay with her. Mm -hmm. Well, the lady's like, can you pass a drug test? I was like, yeah. She's like, well, come on. And I was like, on a Sunday? She's <laughs> like, she said, I've never done an intake on a Sunday, but for some reason I want to do yours. Get up there. She said, now it's your 12 to 18 month program. I'm like, so my head's <laughs> saying, no, no. But my mouth said, okay, I'll do whatever I gotta do. Mm -hmm. And still to this day, I'm like, I don't know how that kind of happened. But I got up there, and like for somebody that's always done what I wanted, when I wanted, how I wanted, didn't care about consequences, never had responsibility, whatever, I needed structure. Mm -hmm. And sweet, they, they gave you some structure up there. You know, you had to be up at a certain time, you had to follow rules. If you didn't apply, uh, comply to those rules, there was consequences. Mm -hmm. Now, we had a thing that they made us do, like if you left your stuff laying out, you had to write 150 sentences. Working definition, humility is the ability to follow directions. Well, I can tell you, I wrote that many a time. <laughs> I think I had my own folder for that. Mm -hmm. But that's what I needed, because mm -hmm. I'd, I'd never been responsible for anything. Right. Got up there, there was this one girl, she got on my very last nerve because she was she, even though she was an addict, she always wanted to do the next right thing, mm -hmm. follow the rules. I got on my nerves. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do that, mm -hmm. and I just didn't like her. And so she ended up being my roommate. Every time we turned around, we was roommates. But she, but she's one of my very best friends now. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you think of integrity or being kind, that's the person, mm -hmm. you know. 
I met another lady up there. Because, you know, I have like, I've got three best friends, and each one of them has something different. Mm -hmm. My best friend Carrie, she tells me like it is, and she'll hang up on me or whatever, because we've been friends for years. Then my friend Lori, you know, she'll be like, bless your heart, baby, I love you, bye. Mm -hmm. And then I got my best friend Tabitha, that's just like, no, you know, uh, that's not, you know, you want to go slap somebody, that's not really a nice thing to do, or, you know, <laughs> whatever. And I'm like, shut up, do you not ever get mad at anybody? But they all have something. Right. That you need That I hear. need. Mm -hmm. And I have to talk to them all the time. Right. And um, so I ended up graduating that place. Mm -hmm. Never thought I was going to do that because for the longest I didn't unpack all my stuff because you know what? Because I went staying there. Mm -hmm. And I was going to leave. And I, and I tell you, even before I graduated, I still, I'm not staying here no more. I ain't done with these rules. And then after I graduated, I still stayed another year. Wow. But I didn't want to, I hated this place. I wasn't going to stay there. Mm -hmm. But it's what I needed. Right. And it gave me a chance to meet people that I needed to meet. Mm -hmm. You know, I never was into, like, for myself, I need meetings. Mm -hmm. I just do. Mm -hmm. You know, that helps me see somebody that, you know, like, especially somebody that's, that just came off the, you know, has not even had 24 hours recovery. I need to see that. But I also need to see somebody that's got 15 years mm -hmm. to let me know, hey, this is possible. Yeah. And then for them to see me, be like, look, I sure don't want to be that train wreck right there. Mm -hmm. You know, right. so that's what I need to do. And, you know, and when I was six months in my recovery, I found out that I had cirrhosis. Mm -hmm. Now, when the doctor tells me this, I'm like, uh-uh, because I don't drink. Right. And the doctor informed me, well, you know, all these overdoses and this and that, that will take a toll on your liver. Mm -hmm. And um, he's just telling me, he's like, you need, you need to be on the transplant list. I have no money. I, have, I mean, mm -hmm. what was I going to do? And, um, and I struggled with that. Mm -hmm. But I will say, now I no longer have to be on the transplant list. That's great. You know, it's because I continue to do the things I need to do, like, one, not get high, mm -hmm. um, and other things. Mm -hmm. um, I even fell at work and shattered my elbow. Mm -hmm. You talk about, you know, I was scared of the pain because it hurt, but I tell you what, when you got a doctor coming at you saying, we'll give you a morphine shot, a Dilaudid shot, all this, the stuff that used to just control, that would light up your heart. Right. Scared the shit out of me. Right. Scared me. Because you did not want to go back to where you have been. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was, that's a great fear. Yeah. And, um, and so I made it out of there. I made it out of that. And my biggest fear was, um, what if I start shooting heroin again? Mm -hmm. And that's not the case at all. Because I continue to do the things that I have been doing mm -hmm. that has kept me sober. Mm -hmm. And I didn't... My doctor explained to me there's a difference in shoot morphine to get high and get morphine because... You you're, need yeah, because you're having emergency surgery. So... You know, it's a lot of things that's happened in my recovery that that could have possibly made me say, you know what, screw all this. Mm -hmm. I, I can't do it. Right. But I didn't. And I tell you what, recovery is not easy. Mm -hmm. Because it's not just about staying off drugs. It's about having to deal with the demons mm -hmm. that you have buried for so long. Right. And it's just, I don't know. I, well, I would think that, I mean, you have to address the cause of why you mm -hmm. decided to go down that path in the first place. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the cause was me. Mm -hmm. And I always wanted to blame everybody else. Mm -hmm. You know, 
everybody was the problem. It was never me because I'm the victim. But now I know that I wasn't the victim. I was the cause of everybody else's problem. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but, you know, I mean, it's not, a, it's not okay, but it is okay. Right. To know that, that I was the cause of things, not mm -hmm. everybody else. Right. So some person who is trapped in the cycle of addiction, what would you tell them, uh, you know, to make them aware, to give them hope? You know, in the beginning, it seems like you're never going to get out of that hell. Mm -hmm. You're just not. But if you can just have a idiot, a mind, just the smallest amount of hope mm -hmm. and just grab <coughs> onto that and hold on to it for dear life and just be a little bit of open mindedness and just a tiny bit of willingness, mm -hmm. it'll eventually grow. Right. And to know that things will get better. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't always have to live like, I always thought that, I always thought being on drugs was my, but that's how I was going to die, right. you know, but, but that's not the case. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would have never thought I'd be coming up on three years, mm -hmm. three years, and to have been through some of the things that I've been through, mm -hmm. you know. And I'm going to continue to say it, it is not easy because some days it's hard, but it's like the, the peace that you finally get and the happiness that you get that you thought that you had when you was getting high is so different. Right. So different. I mean, it's the, I don't even know I don't even know how to explain it. Mm -hmm. You know, I my I can I live at my mom and stepdad's again. And these are the two people that any time that I would come to their house, the police were surely behind me telling me to leave. Right. You know, couldn't see my kids. Couldn't see my granddaughter, you know, and it was because, it's not because they wouldn't let me, it was because the choices I made, made it to where I couldn't see them. Right. And you know, it's just like, you know, and I've been in these like, these abusive relationships. I've been the abuser, they have, and I never thought that I was ever worried, ever, ever worthy of having anybody. Mm -hmm. But I'm seeing somebody now that's supportive of my recovery. Mm -hmm. That, you know, that if I'm having a bad day, you know, be like, okay, well, don't be a crybaby. Mm -hmm. You know, people, you know, mm -hmm. and you always have to surround yourself with people who are going to speak life into you, right. not drain life out of you. Right. Right. And I think that it's easy you know, it, for me, it just takes one word for somebody to say one negative word. And then I've got about 1,500 negative words that, you can that I can say to myself. Right. And I'm trapped again. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, let me ask you this. What would you say to those parents who have, has a child that is in the cycle of addiction? that is going down that road and making those choices, what would you say to those people? Do not be in denial mm -hmm. on what's going on. Right. You know, it's so easy to say, well, if you quit hanging out with that person right there, you wouldn't be doing this. Mm -hmm. You know, because that's how my family has seen people, but you know what? There's people who've been good that that I've made go bad. I guess that's what you would say, mm -hmm. you know. And like, and I used to, if I would always be like, I'm gonna die if you, if I don't get that twenty five dollars. You don't understand how sick I am. I'm gonna die. No, I wasn't gonna die. But I tell you what, that that little bit of money that you can give your kid might be the last. And you know, that's what my stepdad told me. He said, you will not take the money that I earn 
that I gotta work and earn to support your habit to kill yourself. Mm -hmm. You find another way to do it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was doing. They would go to work and I would just, what they wouldn't give and I was taking. Right. You know, mm -hmm. that's not, it, it's just crazy. And you know, and yeah, of course you, you feel like you're dying because in withdrawals there's something serious, mm -hmm. but you're not going to. What you're going to die of is continue to stay in that same cycle right. and to think, not my kid. Right. You know, or, you know, I've had a friend that was in recovery, so much we have one more time. Mm -hmm. They're not here anymore. Right. It's, I'm going to try it one more time, or this is going to be my last time. There's no do overs, mm -hmm. there's just not. Mm -mm. And I think people get confused on that. Mm -hmm. Or, I'm not shooting heroin, I'm just gonna snort it. Still, you don't know, you don't know where you're getting. Right. Or, you know, I you say, well, I know my dealer. Well, I may know my dealer, but I don't know who, you know. Where he got it. Yeah. It from. And I think a lot of people are kind of confused on that. Mm-hmm. You know, you never know where something's coming from. Right. And you never know what kind of habit they have or, you know, what kind of demon they're fighting. You know, and you, you mm -hmm. just don't know. So the best thing, it is, best thing to do is just don't try it. Right. And for families not to educate your kid, educate your kids before somebody else does. Right. Right. Because I would much rather say, I've educated my kids on this didn't say somebody else educated them and they're not here anymore right. and life's not fair. Right. Because I can promise you there's probably tons of families mm -hmm. that think that. Right. So, I mean. What do you think <clears throat> needs to happen uh, in society as a whole so people don't go down this road? the cycle of addiction and the pain that it causes everyone involved. What do you think we can do as a society to address this problem? Educate, educate, educate. Mm -hmm. and, and you know what, if, and like for myself, I never had any consequences, mm -hmm. you know? You had to have consequences, right? You know, um, and I didn't have that, and I I dang sure didn't take responsibility for anything, mm -hmm. um, and I just you know, like and the, you know, and I say this, I used to hate these uh, these documentaries mm -hmm. because I will never forget one day I was coming I came home and I was high. And I was walking through the living room, and my stepdad was watching some documentary on heroin in the morning sides, and I'm just like, and it's on this big screen TV, and I'm like, damn documentaries. And he looks over at me, and all I can do is drop my head and walk to my bedroom mm -hmm. and hurry up and try to get out of the house. Mm -hmm. But knowing, you know, you don't have to read a book on this crap. You can watch a documentary, and I tell you what, that doc documentary would teach you more mm -hmm. than reading some little pamphlet of the warning signs that they're just a bad teenager. Hell, all teenagers are bad, or at mm -hmm. least I was. Mm -hmm. You know, just don't be blind. Right. Don't be blind to the fact, I just think what happened to my kid, yeah. because it will. Right. Because a lot of times, denial is and not thinking about it and not educating people is what starts people down the road to make that exactly. choice. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You know, like like I said, when I was growing up, you never heard of heroin. Right. I mean, like you did in New York, but not around here. Right. Um, so people need to, to get their head out of the sand because this is a big issue. Mm -hmm. It's a problem. Yeah. And it is affecting everybody. And it may not just affect your kid, because it's going to affect the whole family. Mm -hmm. Because if you had that one daughter, 
that's doing it and she's got a younger sister, nine times out of ten, that one right there is just going to follow right behind. Right. And, you know, it's just, and don't be scared to talk to talk to your kids about it. Mm -hmm. Of course, they're going to be mad. I mean, who, I mean, because every teenager or whatever, they know it all anyway. Right. You know, so why? I already know they teach us that at school. You know what? The school will teach you some things, but they're not going to teach you the the rawness of it all. No. You know. No, they don't. They sugarcoat it. Right. To make it palatable. Exactly. Let me ask you this. You talk about education, education, education. What do you think that we as a society need to do a better job? How do you think we need to educate people in order to make people aware so that, you know, they recognize that their ch child is having some problems or they recognize that, you know, the, the their child's friend is having a problem? What can we do? as to educate ourselves to be more aware. I think as far as like, as schools, instead of popping in a DVD or whatever, mm -hmm. you need to bring somebody in there that's lost their kid. Mm -hmm. Right. You know? Or someone who is struggling through the problem and has been recovered that can tell of the, that absolute ghastly Hell. nightmare that that existence yeah. requires because it's easier well not easier but you pay more attention when you hear somebody right. then I mean because when I was in school and they put in a tape or whatever I was going to sleep right you know mm -hmm. and oh drugs are bad right. you know you need to so you know so here's a picture of somebody that was at one time they had their life was good, mm -hmm. and now look, right. you know, they weigh 95 pounds, mm -hmm. you know, they have no, they have no yeah. life. Yeah, it's being robbed from them. Yeah. And the thing of it is, I think that, um, I know that I, as a person, and I know <clears throat> I remember back when I was a child, if you see someone who is in front of your face and they're telling you a story and they're telling you about heartache and nastiness and pain and misery and defeat mm -hmm. it makes more of an impression right. than popping in that videotape because you can't ignore somebody's pain that's right in you front cannot. of you you can't and there are so many people in our communities that are suffering mm -hmm. there's children there's the parents of of the children there's there's whole groups of people in the community that are absolutely in pain and misery who need to get that out and we need to educate the children that are in school the captive audience as to why we don't need to be doing this right you know? and you know and it kills me when i hear somebody say Oh, I wish there was something we could have done. You could have done something. Right. You could have got your ass out of denial mm -hmm. and addressed the situation mm -hmm. and not be like worried about what somebody else is going to think. Right. You know, mm -hmm. that just kills me. Mm -hmm. And I used to, I remember my first in heroin walk I went to. Well, my best friend Carrie had went to the one the year before that when mm -hmm. I was still in active addiction. And she tried to get me to go. Oh, I'll go, I'll go. But I was like, I'm not going to that. I don't want to see all that. I'm going to stay home and get out. So she ends up wearing this little lantern that mm -hmm. says, I'm walking for my friend Levanto. And she posted it on Facebook. And I was so mad. I was like, how dare her just out me like that on Facebook? Like everybody don't already know. Right. But I would always tell my dad and them, um, you're not around. You don't, I'm not, you, you don't know what I'm going through or it's not affecting you. I don't see you. Mm -hmm. And then I remember my first in heroin walk, seeing all the families mm -hmm. crying, mm -hmm. friends that are gone, these banners, all these people gone. Yeah. And that was the first time that I ever 
And I think I almost had like a year sober that I ever stopped to think, damn, my mom, my dad, my sister, my brother, everybody, stepdad, what the sleepless nights they probably had. Yeah. That call that they were waiting. Yeah. On. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and it's just, I just can't say it enough. You gotta get your head out of the sand because, um, epidemic is probably you know and it's like and I understand the coronavirus is serious I understand that but I tell you what if you was I'm probably pissing, pissing people off but it's okay if you was taking half the time mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to help these other people that are suffering instead of judging them mm -hmm. you know we might see better results. Right. And a lot of times helping someone isn't a pat on the back or a hug. No. Sometimes it's a kick in the britches. Yeah. Sometimes it's making some hard, terrible decisions to get that person some help. Yeah. It's because it's not pretty. Mm -mm. It's not pretty. Right. And uh, nothing involved with it is pretty. Right. And, um, you know, but there are resources. Right. And can you tell people about the resources that you got for help? Well, you know, I was fortunate for Bradford to do that. Mm -hmm. But, like, now there's tons of, well, there's a lot more places that are willing to help. Right. Like, the place that I went to. I didn't have $800. Mm -hmm. However, they when I got my job, I was able to pay that. Right. But you just can't say, oh, I need a place to come, you know, mm -mm. because a lot of them places will probably help you if you're like, like, I'm desperate. Right. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, this is my last resort. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, Anybody can say, I need to come to rehab because I'm going to go to jail. Right. I've been one of those. Right. So, you know. Yeah. But also, if you don't want to be there, don't come. Mm -hmm. Because there's somebody out there suffering mm -hmm. that's dying to get there. Right. And they can't because you're holding up a spot. Right. Because you don't want to sit in jail. Right. Or you don't, or you want to make mom and daddy happy. Right. Or your wife. Or right. Or well, whatever. Like. Right, fill in the blank. Is there anything in closing that you want to say that you think needs to be said to people? You know, don't give up. Mm -hmm. Don't give up. I mean, it does. It does get better, but it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's scary. It is scary. Mm -hmm. The unknown is scary. Yeah. You know, change is scary. You know, you get comfortable in doing the same thing because, like with me, I knew my everyday schedule. Mm -hmm. I knew what I knew what I was going to be doing. But when I got clean, I didn't know was mm -hmm. I going to fail? Was I going to succeed? Mm -hmm. What What was going to happen to me? Was mm -hmm. I going to do all this and still be the same person and end up getting high again? You know, that's that's scary. Mm -hmm. You know, and just be. Like, and even if the court system does send you, be open-minded, mm -hmm. you know, but just be open-minded. Be willing to, you know, if the court system sends you there for a year, you might as well make the best of it because you're going to be there a year. Right. Because I've seen people that's been court-ordered to a year and they're still sober and they dang sure didn't want to be there, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's just like, you know... I don't know. You people's got to be more involved. Mm -hmm. Be involved. Yeah. Families need to be involved. It should be, you know, I understand that families work or whatever. Of course they have to. Mm -hmm. But you know what? At some point in time, you're going to see your kid or whoever for five or ten minutes. Talk mm -hmm. to them. And you know what? And don't be scared to ask for help. I mean, because what's the worst they're going to do? I mean, mm -hmm. after your ass is going to rehab, you know, mm -hmm. don't, I mean, 
don't be afraid to ask for help mm -hmm. because I promise you there's going to be somebody that's going to help you. Mm -hmm. There's going to be somebody that wants to give you a chance because nobody, because everybody is sick of seeing lives lost, mm -hmm. lives lost mm -hmm. because it gets getting younger and younger mm -hmm. and younger. Right. Because currently this country is, is an epidemic. We've lost almost a whole generation yeah. of people that will never, you know, um, go to college or get married or have babies or do anything because they're dead. Right. And that's why this, in education and telling people stories mm -hmm. and getting this information out there is so critical because we're losing our, our future. Right. And, um, so I appreciate you coming in today, Thank LaVonda. You. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I know that you have had a tough road <laughs> that you have had to hoe, but thank you for telling your story, and I hope every day it gets easier and easier for I you. That too. And I wish you the best of happiness and health and, and amazing life yourself in the future thanks and I just hope just so if it's just one person yeah you know that's all I need all, yeah. all you need is just that a little yeah. bit I mean you yeah. gotta have a monument a monument size of hope just a little bit yes and if we can just help one person then maybe that one, one person, person can help, help another person <laughs> yeah. and and we've done our part you know to help each other right so thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Everybody, I hope that you will listen to LaVonda and her story. And the previous interview that we did with Miss Angie Cheshire and realized that we're losing people that we don't need to lose. Please educate yourself and be aware and help people who need help. These are mothers, these are our daughters, these are our friends, our family, and our neighbors. No one's life is not important enough to not try to save. So, I'm going to post some numbers and some resources after this interview. If you need help, there's going to be someone that can help you. Do not give up hope. Until next time, this is Suzanne Hubbard, over and out.